Welcome to Submarine Live. We're delighted to have you with us as we connect to the crew on the Necton First Ascent mission. Now, they're exploring the uncharted depths around the Seychelles archipelago in the Indian Ocean and using submersibles uh, to do that, to take scientists down to depths that have never previously been visited, so down to 250 300 meters. Now, Submarine Live is part of the AXA XL education program, and we are based at Sonodyne HQ, an amazing UK marine engineering uh, company that is making a lot of this underwater exploration possible. And we, I think, um, before we see if we can get a line into the expedition vessel, I've just got a few shout outs uh, to some schools. So we have countries watching. We have the UK, Turkey, Bermuda, USA, Colombia and Albania. Welcome to all our viewers in those countries and great to give a few shout outs as well. We've got the Middle East Technical University, we have St. Ursula's Catholic Federation, uh, Windermere School, and St. Bridget's Primary in Glasgow. Really wonderful to have all those schools with us. And I think I have on the line, I have Paris, one of the scientists on the Necton First Ascent mission, and Paris, a benthic ecologist, looking at the life that lives on the bottom of the ocean. Paris, are you receiving us? Yes, I do. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sparing some time. I know on a very, very busy science day. Um, but perhaps just to kick us off before we get to the questions being sent in by the students, could you just explain to us what Necton First Descent is all about? Absolutely. So as a general kind of framework, we already know that our oceans are in trouble. We have plastic pollution, coral reef loss, overfishing. And at the same time, even though the, our oceans are three quarters of our planet, we have very, very little information. So in order to be able to kind of mitigate our impacts, we have to get information which we're currently lacking. So what Necton First Descent is trying to do, we try, we want to go to, we are already in the Seychelles and we want to get information about the marine ecosystems here, about the coral reefs that are in Seychelles that have been so little studied so far. So we're trying to establish that baseline information, which we hope will kind of provide all the necessary uh, tools for um, legislators to kind of try and conserve the ocean. So it's really kind of an exploration in order to get baseline information from the very little studied Indian Ocean. So students watching may have seen some of the issues facing the ocean in the news. They mm -hmm. may have seen the plastics issue, which has received a lot of media attention. And what we're, I'm hearing from you is that we actually don't know that much about the ocean and that we're going to these places for the first time as scientists or e even as, as, as a species. Um, to find mm -hmm. out what's happening down there. Is, 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 am I on the right track? You're completely on the right track. So most of, uh, in the Indian Ocean and in Seychelles in particular, we have very, very little information for what's going on below 30 meters. That's traditionally what scuba divers are able to explore on their own. But as soon as you go below that level, you need more sophisticated tools, you need probably technical divers, you need submersibles, and it's not always possible to study those depths. So below 30 meters, we have very little information. And in Seychelles in particular, I think there have been potentially like one or two studies in the past decade or so. So what we're trying to do is explore these depths and get all this information that is currently lacking with submersibles and with remotely operated vehicles. Yeah, and, and I hear some, some, some action on the back deck behind you. Is, and, and I imagine yes. one of the submersibles is, is about to come back to deck. Um, whilst that is going on, from a science point of view, what does it mean to you to explore the depths in a submersible? Tell us a little bit about that. I think there are many different ways to explore kind of the deep ocean. 
as I said before, we have remotely operated vehicles and other instruments, and then you have submersibles. So the submersibles are really unique compared to all of the other equipment because you get to be as a scientist or even as a non-scientist in it and actually witness all the amazing underwater environments that you usually get to see only via videos. So being able to dive there and see those environments live is a unique connection that you cannot get with any other type of equipment. So it's really great to be able to do those dives. So Paris, just, just for our school audience watching, and I don't know whether we can see the small submersible full screen on, on, on my desk here, but this is a, a very small ROV, and ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. And that's almost like a small robot with a camera, or, or big robot with a mm -hmm. camera that you'd send down. Yeah. And then you're talking about actually being inside a submersible with these amazing sort of uh, round pressure hulls. Paris, you've, you've been down in one of these. Uh, can you tell us what it felt like? It felt really strange, I think is, is, is the best word, because I have been studying marine environments for over 10 years now, and looking through a computer screen is not comparable to going down there. It was relatively kind of very soothing. You kind of feel with a submersible, it's kind of blends very nice with the environment. And it feels like you're actually the one that the fish are looking at because you are in this fish bowl, if you like, in the submersible. And it feels like the fish are observing you rather than the other way around. So I feel like I'm going to an environment where actually I, I'm being observed rather than observe. So it's a really interesting perspective, but it's, it, it, it's really, really cool to be able to see all these corals and fish from so close, literally like 10 centimeters of glass separating you. Uh, it sounds incredible. I'm just going back to your introduction and I have a question in um, from Nadia in Sheffield in the UK. Uh, listening to are humans the only reason that ocean health is deteriorating? Of course, uh, humans are not the only reason why ocean health might be deteriorating. For example, you might have spread of diseases in corals, uh, for example, from other organisms like sponges, which is a natural phenomenon. So if you like, there is a natural variability uh, in the conditions we have in the ocean. But what is really happening the past hundred years is there is an acceleration in, in the change in our oceans. And that is definitely human made. Um, so we're kind of pushing the oceans towards um, new kind of scenarios that we haven't even imagined before. So the majority of it is, is man-made essentially the past hundred years or so. And uh, I think we can see um, behind you the submersible being brought in. It, it, can you, I mean, you've probably seen this many times. I think you're on the sort of 35th dive of this mission. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening behind you? So right now, the submersible just reached the surface. What is happening is they're opening the hatch. So the pilot and the co-pilot, they go out of the submersible and they go into the chase boat because it's much, much safer to physically remove, if you like, the submersible and transport it onto the ship with no one being inside it. So as soon as they're out, they go to the chase boat, then they come into the boat via ladder. And the submersible, as you can see, it's already hooked. And with a crane, we transport it into the deck of our ship. And so, I mean, we've, we've got the chase boat going out, and you have two people in the uh, submersible, and you talk about there being a pilot and a co-pilot. Does that mean, yes. as a scientist, that you are also a submersible co-pilot? Yes, essentially, the pilot is always like, a, you know, a specialized person who knows how to drive submersibles. I could never do that unless I had like specific training for years. So usually the second person, which could be a scientist for this expedition, is mostly a scientist or maybe a media person who wants to report about the underwater environments is essentially the co-pilot. Yeah. So I have been co-pilot for a couple of times. And uh, Which is a nice type. It's, it's, I can just see the, um, the crew coming out behind you um, at the moment, getting into the chase boat. And then I imagine yeah. that the, um, I can see a strap coming down. What, what is the next stage yes. in, in recovering the submersible at the end of a science dive? So right now we have 
that strap that you're seeing is uh, connected to a crane of the ship and then that will be moved onto the science deck. So as soon as the, the submersible reaches the science deck and everything is clear and safe to and it's safe to approach it, the first thing we will do is we'll go to the bio box, which is a sort of box where it contains specimens that have been collected for the deep. And all the scientists will go there with buckets filled with water, take all the samples, put them in the bucket and go in the lab to try and preserve them in different chemicals for later analysis. Amazing. And so do you have um, s specific uh, uh, samples that are being collected on, on, on this journey or, or, or have you been working on your samples um, in, in, in the lab um, whilst the, the submersible has been going down at depth? So the majority of the processing of the samples, if you like, when you try to identify what kind of species it is, will ha probably happen after the expedition, just because there is not enough time and you need some sort of tools that are not readily available on a ship. But you always have a first look under the microscope or you go with guides to make a first assessment of what you're actually having in front of you. So it's a bit of both, really. And Paris, I can see we're, we're, we're getting to a stage with the, with the submersible being load, lowered onto deck. Is there any chance that you can pan or tilt the uh, camera a little so that the students can see that um, taking place? Well, the thing is, I have like a big barrier, so I don't think you can see it because as soon as I go there... It's okay. Well, perfect. Well, That's thank probably you so like, much for trying. No. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no problems at all. Um, we've um, got a few things. Is um, Ivy um, or Evie in Ealing um, is is asking how difficult is it to collect your samples? I mean, how do you do it? I mean, you obviously can't mm. open the hatch and reach out and grab stuff. Yeah. So, how do you go about collecting samples at depth? So, our red submersible, which is the submersible that collects samples, has the bio box, which I already referred to, mm -hmm. which is a sort of like essentially a box with biology, but it also has a manipulator arm, uh, which essentially, as soon as you hint what you want to collect to the pilot, then he can go maneuver this manipulator arm and then he can collect all the different organisms. Now, in terms of how difficult it is, it depends on the type of organism. If you have something that is really soft, and fleshy, for example, if you have jellies, it's really tricky to actually be able to grab them. Fish, out of the question, because they're too fast, there is no way you can get them with the arm. If you have something more solid, like a soft coral or a hot or a hard coral or a sponge, then it's relatively easy to actually pick it up and put it in the bio box. So, so it depends on the organism. Depends on the organism. I'm, and so being a, a, a benthic ecologist, you're studying are you studying those sort of sponges and corals that live on the bottom and, and the animals that live on those? Exactly. So I'm interested in everything that occupies space on the seafloor. And the majority, at least here in Seychelles, and is usually corals, sponges. If you're on the shallows, you might get algae as well or sea, gra or sea grasses. Uh, and then you might also have other things like sea urchins or sea cucumbers when you go a bit deeper. Sea, sea cucumbers? You say, I mean, is that a kind of yes. vegetable? No, it's an animal. <laughs> it just resembles as a shape a cucumber, so we called it a sea cucumber. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, it belongs in the same kind of um, big family together with the sea urchins. Fantastic. And um, I've, I've got some um, questions coming through a little bit about um, submarine uh, piloting. And I think that Oliver will be joining us in a bit. And so I'll, I'll spare you trying to uh, come up with your, your piloting question skills. Um, but what do you mm. hope to find uh, by doing a mission like this? Is, is there something that you're looking for? So the main kind of reason, as I said, maybe in the beginning is that because we literally have no information below 30 meters, by studying everything below between 30 and 500 meters is essentially creating that baseline information. So any kind of information we have about these environments is a bonus and a win for us scientists. In particular, as, as, as if you ask me as Paris, I'm interested in see how coral communities, if they are affected in deeper waters from climate change and ocean acidification, we know that the shallow reefs are in trouble because of rising sea surface temperatures. I want to see, are the deep ones healthy or are they also in trouble? 
So just for our students watching who, who may not know a little bit about this, we have uh, tropical coral reefs in the shallows. And mm -hmm. you may have seen the newspaper when the, when the, or on the news when there goes white. That's a, uh, a, a change that we call coral bleaching, and that's because there is a warming of the ocean. And if I understand it, exactly. we know how our, the warming is affecting um, that part of the ocean. I think we've got some, some deeper corals and deeper sea fans sort of com coming up on, on, on the footage on, on, on the broadcast. Uh, but what you're saying is that we know that warming is happening on the in the surface layers, maybe between zero and sort of 20, 30 meters, but we don't know what's happening at, at depth and if, if human activity is, is even changing these amazing deep communities. And I can see these now on screen. I can see it. Are those sort of, uh, is that a the, the, the white strand I can see? Is that a whip coral or something? Um, I'm not sure what you're seeing because <laughs> I cannot see, but uh, uh, probably. Um, but it's amazing. So you're, what you're looking at is, is how these deep communities might be affected um, by, uh, by, by changes that the humanity is causing. I've got a question coming in from St. Bridget's Primary um, from Lucas. And I know that you won't know necessarily what species you f have found until you do further analysis after the expedition. The question from Lucas is, what new species would you like to find? I would like to find new species of corals in particular because that's kind of like the main type of organisms you see like in deeper reefs, anything kind of below 30 meters if you like. Um, but any type of new species, even if it's a sponge, which is not my type of expertise, if you like, or a new species of fish, that would be super exciting. And of course, we don't know, as you said, right now, if you have a new species, we need to kind of process them and go through a whole procedure, which takes months, sometimes even years. But when you go to the deep where no one has ever been before, the likelihood of finding new species, I think, is very high. So I'm pretty sure we're going to get dozens, if not hundreds, of new species by the end of this expedition. Um, maybe Paris, I, I know you've been, I think you've been working on some of the samples that came back from Bermuda from the first Necton mission. Uh, how many yes. new species did you find from that? Just to give us an idea on a relatively well explored area of the ocean, um, how many new species did you find then? So Bermuda, we found approximately 100 new species. A lot of them were algae, but we also find two meter long wire corals that were literally next to Bermuda, a couple of hundred meters away from the shore, but no one even knew it existed, they existed. So if you extrapolate these findings and now you go to the Indian Ocean, which is a more diverse area and where very little information exists, I think we're gonna find multiple times more species. So probably many more hundreds, I would think. But again, that will take probably a, a bit of time. A bit of time. Um, and I think just going back to, I mean, it's fascinating to, to think that, you know, I, f personally, from my point of view, you, you always think that scientists go somewhere, you see something and they go, ooh, that looks new, I found a new species. But of course, there's so much work that goes into it. Coming back to the more romantic side of going under the water, um, uh, Sonny in Hackney um, would like to know, what is the most amazing thing about seeing deep in the ocean? So the most amazing thing when you see things in the, in the deeper ocean, the thing at least that strikes me the most is that everything is completely dark. So if you go below 200 meters and through the process of going from zero to 200 meters, light is getting less. So obviously at 200 meters and below, you have no light. So it's complete darkness. So the only thing you can see is through the lights of the submersible. This kind of creates a very mystique kind of environment. It's very kind of interesting to just be there and observe. So, so I think the darkness yeah. is the, the th sorry. Yeah, I was just seeing if we, we, we've, we've got some, some dark, deep, dark um, ocean um, the footage that we can show um, Paris um, as, as we, uh, as we uh, um, do this. I think also we, we, we've seen, um, also you may have seen a sunfish. I don't know whether you, you were on that um, trip uh, or the, on that dive when the sunfish came and visited one of the, of the submersibles. 
I wasn't on that particular dive, that was our colleague, Professor Louise Alcock from Ireland. So she was in the submersible, kind of lurking around, doing her transit work. And then suddenly she saw that big sunfish, which was almost the size of the acrylic hull. And of course, she was amazed by it. And she took straight away videos and all of it has been recorded. I haven't been so lucky. I haven't seen something as amazing as a huge sunfish. But I've seen manta rays from afar and different sharks. So that was quite cool. Great. Well, I think we've got a, a shark piece that we can show in a little bit. Uh, but um, that goes on to my next question. And this is from Taylor in uh, St. Bridget's Primary. Uh, really interested in the um, number of girls who are on the expedition. And is, is this something that both um, boys and girls at school at the moment can aspire to? I think actually if, if I don't have exact numbers, but we're definitely out outnumbered by female scientists. In general, the field of marine biology, we have a lot of uh, women in science who kind of follow that path. And right now, I think the science team, we're 11 people and the men are three and eight are women. So there's definitely a lot of women who choose to be marine biologists. And if anyone is listening out there right now and they have an aspiration to become a marine biologist and you're a woman, please feel free, free to do it. There's a lot. Um, so it's definitely a very nice environment to work. Amazing. Um, that, that's really fantastic. And, and I think probably later in the week, we'll, we'll have uh, some of those voices um, on some of these live broadcasts. I'm not saying you're not brilliant, Paris, but I think it's great to show the diversity of um, yes. professional scientists on the expedition with you. Um, we've got a, a, a Can couple I of... Sorry. I, I, I At any given moment, I know you wanted also some, some questions with uh, piloting and submersibles, so Oliver is ready whenever you want him to jump into. Great. But I'm happy well, to take any more questions. Um, yeah. but well, well, there are a few here, um, Paris, on the submersible yes. side, so I, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll piloting side, so maybe we'll, we'll pass over uh, to Oliver, um, who, who I think has just finished being a deck boss. Yeah, he just finished being a deck boss and he's ready to, to talk to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Paris. Thank Thanks you for so having so me. Much. Yes, and hope. Yeah, thank you a lot for having me. Oliver. Hello. Hello. How are you? You safely recovered the submersible? Yes, we've just brought Omega back from a, a very long dive. It was down for four and a half hours, and it came up with a whole treasure, uh, a whole load of treasures from the deep. A lot of sponges and lots of corals, lots of wonderful things. Oh, well, that's really exciting. Um, Paris has been amazing uh, answering uh, a lot of great science questions. There are, there are a number of questions coming through about the actual submersible operations and submersible exploration side of this, which I thought you may be better placed to answer. So I've, I've saved them up for you. Um, Thank you. Uh, a Miss uh, Clayden's class um, would like to know how long does it take to build a submersible? A very good question. Um, well, the submarines, we, the submersibles which we use, um, they take uh, about 12 months to build. And the reason why it takes that long is, is the actual pressure hull. So the glass sphere, it's, it's made out of, of acrylic, a kind of plastic. That can take up to six months for it to be formed accurately without any little cracks or anything else in it. Uh, and then you've got to assemble a whole array of really complex pieces of equipment into a pretty small area. So it takes about 12 months, including with testing. Amazing. and. Uh... Oliver, you're, you are a uh, submersible pilot, um, and we can see um, we've got some footage running of uh, one of the Triton submersibles exploring uh, the deep ocean at the moment. But is, is, is there a, a submarine driving test you have to pass before they let you down there? <laughs> yes, there is. Um, it, we don't call it a driving test, it's a pilot test, because we work in the three dimensions of the ocean. Uh, we have to go up and down and left and right. So a bit like a helicopter pilot is how we do it. So we have to do a whole lot of test uh, training. The first few weeks are in the uh, in the garage, learning about how it actually works, uh, all the electronics um, and then all the systems. And then we get to go into a simulator to so actually try it before we get into sea. 
And then you have to do a whole range of, uh, of tests and practices when you're actually at sea and run through lots of different scenarios. What happens if this happens or that happens or if a shark comes or you get too close to a cliff or those type of things. So yeah, that's how it works. And you have to get your, uh, your license. So I've got my license um, so I can safely uh, manage a submersible, but I'm not a Formula One driver yet. So in the same way with uh, piloting submersibles, um, you pass, then, you, then you're able to um, operate. But our two main uh, sub pilots are Formula One drivers in many ways. They are real experts. So um, they're really leading the diving at the moment. That's f fantastic. And, and it, it has ushered in a sort of a new opportunity for deep ocean exploration. So we can, you can go down now, and, and it's amazing that the next and first ascent team are, are going places that no one has been before. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Nofels uh, uh, Klaas, and is really comparing ocean exploration and space exploration. And the question is, do you think we should spend more money on ocean exploration than exploring space? <laughs> well, if you're asking me, then of course. Um, I mean, NASA's uh, budget to tell their story to the world uh, is the same as the entire amount of money that's spent on ocean research in America. So it's only a fraction of the amount of money spent on ocean research compared to space exploration. Um, and so there is a big gap at the moment. Um, I, I really think we need to spend more money on, on, on ocean exploration because it is the most important part of our planet. It's, uh, it makes up the vast majority of our planet, the ecosystem, which is where there are animals and where there is life on our planet is in the ocean. But we have better maps of, uh, of, outer sp of, of planets in outer space than we actually do of our own seabed. Um, and the ocean is so important to us because of the food that we eat, because of the oxygen that we breathe, uh, because of our planet's climate, we really need to understand more about how it works. So a lot more money needs to go into ocean exploration and scientific research. I mean, it, it's, it's, it seems like it's an otherworldly, and I think that's where the comparison between being an astronaut in space and, and what you are and who, uh, your team are, are aquanauts in, in, in the deep ocean. And a question uh, coming down is, you, you're going down, but how how far and i'm just going to get this is is how many meters down and this is from lucas at St. bridget's primary how many meters down can a submarine go without the pressure getting too high very good question so every 10 meters you go down in the ocean you get another atmosphere of pressure so on the surface where we are it's one atmosphere 10 meters down you've got double that two atmospheres so at the deepest part of the ocean is seven miles down which is the equivalent of 1,100 times the pressure uh, that we have on the surface. Um, and that's the equivalent of having 50 jumbo jets resting on your head. So it's a huge amount of pressure. So far, only three people have been down to the deepest part of our ocean in submarines. There is a, uh, apparently there could be a fourth who's gonna, uh, in, in, uh, in the next uh, few months, they may well be, a fourth person may be going down, a guy called Victor Vescovo on five deeps, check it out. Uh, but yeah, so only three people have been down. The first two went down in 1960. So nearly 60 years ago, a guy called Don Walsh and Jacques Picard. And their project was called Project Necton, which is why we're called Necton in many ways, uh, because we've, uh, we've taken the name after their amazing feat. Incredible. And I mean, you're, you're going down in, uh, in this wonderful sort of almost like paradise um, in the Seychelles archipelago. The, a question from Amira in Bethnal Green um, is, is there anywhere you would love to explore? Oh, yes, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of places. Um, and um, where do you start? I mean, the ocean is so vast and we've only explored, um, according to the scientists, uh, a fraction of 1% of the ocean. So a very small amount of our ocean has been explored. So there's some, you know, the range of really exciting places to see. I particularly love the animals. So going to areas where there are lots of those animals. Um, and I'd really like to go into the deeper part of the ocean as well. 
so down to a thousand to three thousand meters because it's at that depth where you have the greatest number of different animals on the surface we have the greatest number the greatest quantity of animals is on the surface but as you go down between one and three thousand meters down that's where you get more different animals than anywhere else so i'd love to go down into those depths and I think we can just see one of those animals that you have come across um, during the trip, uh, which we have uh, up at the moment, which is a thresher shark, um, an amazing yes. creature. And, and it must be very special for the team when they have those sort of rather unworldly, uh, um, otherworldly, in fact, encounters with this kind of creature. Absolutely. I mean, it's... Um it's a great privilege to see those animals and the incredible, beautiful sharks in their natural environment. Uh, I've just spoken to our pilots who've just come out of the submersible and they've said they saw a large number of hammerhead sharks on this dive. So that's the first sighting we've had of quantities of hammerheads. So that's, uh, that's the news literally from a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we've seen thresher sharks, as, um, as you've said, and also the six gill shark, which is a real deep diving shark. We've uh, seen them at 300 meters as well. I mean, uh, and the reason why the sharks sorry go ahead no 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 pete i, I want more 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 shark tails <laughs> well the reason the sharks are so important is because they're at the top of the food chain they are what we call apex predators so if you've got sharks in these environments that means you've got a really healthy uh, food web a really healthy environment because they're the ones right at the top they're kind of like the lions if you like on the on the, uh, the, the, the great savannas in, in Africa, say. So when you've got them, you know that beneath them, you've got a lot of, a lot of uh, healthy environment and healthy uh, animals. Wonderful. I've, I've got a question here from Michael at St. Bridget's Primary. And, and Michael's a little concerned about your general health, it seems, and, and is wondering whether the depth affects your lungs. <laughs> Uh, no, it doesn't, fortunately, um, when we go in submersibles, because we have a, what's called a pressure sphere. So you can see in front of Jamie, the, the pressure sphere there is where the submersibles sit. And that is at the same pressure as we had on the surface. So that uh, is how uh, we ensure that we don't uh, have any effects on our lungs when we go down. If you're diving, of course, that is a different um, situation, because then you're physically being compressed by the weight of the water above you. And, and th there's more concern coming through from our, our students. Roman um, said that he has watched a video about life in a submarine and it was terrible. Um, so <laughs> what is the difference between a, a, a submarine that you may see in a, a war film, for instance, um, and the submersibles that you're using? So the submarines that you see in, in the films, firstly, they don't really have windows. Um, and which is a great shame. So you can't really look out and see everything, but they're obviously used for different things. So they have a lot more people in there and they have to stay underwater for a large, uh, long periods of time undertaking. Uh, it's a very difficult work that they're doing. What we do is very, very different. We are down there to, to try and understand the ocean uh, and learn about it and research. And so that's why we have our big, our big clear, our big sphere, which is clear, like a big glass bowl. Um, and so that provides us with the, the ability to be able to look out. It's like being in a inverse fishbowl instead of being um, uh, like being a fish inside looking out, except it's the other way around. And we've got lots of fish looking at us because we've got this amazing um, ability to look out in every direction that gives our scientists the opportunity to see things and to observe and ask questions. And that's the beginning of of the journey of learning to be able to ask questions. And they can only ask questions if they can see things. Um, so that's the major difference in, in what we do. Our, um, our submersibles are also have yeah, a whole range of different scientific equipment. Um, the difference between a submersible, technical difference between a submersible and a submarine is that a submersible has to have a support ship, what we call a mothership. A submarine can operate independently without a ship. Amazing. Um, we, uh, more concern coming through from, from our students, this time on an environmental front. Um, this is from Ariana, um, who would like to know, does it annoy you uh, that there are species that haven't been discovered yet, but could be affected by plastic pollution? 
Yes, it is very, very sad. Um, we've only discovered a fraction of uh, the animals, the species that live in our ocean. Um, and so we don't know what's happening to, to a lot of them and a lot of the ones that we know about. So we have a race, uh, a race against time to discover what is there before it is destroyed or before it is um, uh, impacted by plastic and also by other things uh, which are going on on our ocean, whether it be heat that we've produced, it's being absorbed into the ocean, makes it hotter, which makes it more difficult for some animals to then live in those depths, or other forms of pollution, chemicals that come rushing off fields, for example, into our rivers and into the sea. That has an effect. Even the wrong type of sun, sun cream can have an effect. One drop of normal sun cream uh, in the equivalent of a big, uh, big swimming pool can cause the death of all the corals in that area. So, you know, just all these little things have have a big impact. And we, we talked there a little bit about uh, species that, that haven't been discovered yet. Um, could you perhaps tell us about some of the, the rarest um, animals or that you have found? Good question. So um, there are, well, from a scientific point of view, um, we've been diving in these in these waters and no one's been here, uh, no one's explored beneath 30 meters. So we often we've been finding lots of corals and sponges and, and fish and other animals um, that we don't know exactly what they are yet. And in order to actually say this is a new animal, this is a new species, takes the scientist a bit of time. So it could be a few weeks, it could be a few months, it could even be a few years until we can identify some of those new animals. On our last expedition, we discovered over 100, and that was in an area that people have been doing their research and their work for over 100 years. Here, no one's been looking in the sea beneath 30 meters here. So there's lots we don't know, lots that we are discovering, and lots we still need to work out. Well, it's, it sounds, sounds like you've got your work cut out. Uh, but interestingly, we've got Eve, who we've spoken a little bit about species. Um, but have you seen any plastic uh, when you've been diving on this expedition? Uh, we haven't seen plastic in uh, or large quantities of it in the water column or on the seabed around here. But we have found a huge amount that's been washed up on these beaches. So there is obviously a lot of plastic which has been collected in, in the sea currents which, co which come around this area and end up on these beaches. So there's been a, a cleanup going on in the last couple of weeks here um, on Al Dabra, and they've been cleaning up all, the, all that plastic. Um, but one thing is important to remember is that the, the vast majority of all the plastic that we have produced is no longer floating on the, um, uh, on the, on the, on, on the sea or on our beaches. Uh, the majority of plastic that has entered our ocean is actually already in the water column, so beneath the surface or on the seabed. The vast majority, maybe up to 90 percent, is not these big islands of plastic that you see. That's a small little bit of it. Most of it is already in the water or on the seabed. Uh, incredibly sad, and but also a, a call to action. Oliver, I think we've just got time for a couple more questions, and thank you so much uh, for sparing this um, time out of your busy day. Before Not at we all. go, I would like to return to the magic of being in a submersible, and Zoe um, would like to know what was it like diving in the submarine for the first time? Well, it's, uh, it was an incredible, incredible experience. I can still remember it. Um, I was actually with you, Jamie. Uh, we were in the Bahamas together um, back in, uh, when was it? I don't know, nearly 10 years ago. Um, and we dived down uh, to, I think, maybe 1,000 meters. Um, and the first thing you see is, is, is the shades of blue that you go through. Um, and at the beginning, it's very uh, sort of bright blue because of the sun coming through. And as you go down, it starts to get darker, of course. But you start to go through these different shades of blue. And blue is such a peaceful color if you're surrounded by blue. So it's incredibly relaxing, um, but also inspiring as you descend down. As you go beneath about 200 meters, it starts, you start to lose all light. And then obviously down at 1,000 meters, there's no light whatsoever. And then you turn the lights on and then you go searching and exploring and trying to find incredible things. And when you do, you put the lights on and the light uh, 
the colors come back in the animals that you see, whether it be fish or sharks or octopus, octopi, corals, whatever, they all come to life. Um, and then I think on that first dive, we also may have seen, no, we did, yeah, we saw some of them, uh, it was called bioluminescence. So this, these are animals which make their own light um, and they light up. So if you shine lights at them, they light up. So it was, it was like being in another world, which we were. Instead of outer space, we were in inner space. Incredible. And I mean, it just sounds like such a, a, a magical uh, world to be in. And it's, it's amazing that you are now able to share this with so many people around the world. Uh, just uh, if I can ask my own question, which is what message would you like to give to the young people on this planet? You're, you're on this incredible voyage of discovery in the Indian Ocean. What would you like them to hear? Well, um, I think we can all make a difference. I, most important thing, I, I would uh, ask you to fall in love with the ocean, because if you fall in love with it, you'll want to look after it. Um, and there's so many reasons why you need to fall in love with the ocean. Uh, one reason is if you like breathing, I'm going to ask everyone who's listening to take two breaths and I'll explain why. Hit first one. Second one. So that second breath, the oxygen in that second breath came from the ocean. It was made by uh, the, the algae, the, uh, the, the green stuff, if you like, uh, in our ocean. Um, and so there are so many reasons to, to love the ocean, um, but also because it's such a beautiful place. Um, it makes life possible on our planet. From outer space, we look blue. We are the blue planet. So we need to look after it. If we want to continue our lives and our livelihoods and, uh, and, in, uh, and, in, and continue to enjoy this wonderful place, we need to look after it. We need to find ways to do it. So firstly, just fall in love with it. Just love being by the ocean. Whenever you go to the sea, I always remember as a kid driving down into, and we were sitting so excited in the back of the car, and it was always be, who would see the sea first? Whenever we came to the sea, it was, it was, it felt different, you know, the air coming, everything, and then just get your goggles on and go and have a look beneath the surface, see what's there. Become an aquanaut. I have, if I had managed to do it, I think anybody can. Uh, amazing, Oliver. So big, big thank you to Oliver Steeds, Chief Executive of Necton, who has been sharing his thoughts and inspiring ideas live from the research vessel in the Indian Ocean. Thank you so much, Oliver, and good luck with the rest of your day. And I think we may be hearing from you and the team tomorrow as well. Thank you very much. Bye-bye from the mission. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being part of this submarine Q&A. We've been connecting to the Necton First Descent mission as part of Submarine Live uh, with the AXA XL Oceans Education Program. And until tomorrow, uh, we've got some more sessions tomorrow. We've got another session coming up uh, today, a live investigation looking at uh, being a submarine engineer. How can we get our submarine safely up and down our little ocean? Tomorrow we have two more live investigations and two more submarine Q&As connecting to the team uh, on the ocean sapphire in the Indian Ocean. Don't forget, if you're loving Submarine Live, we also have Arctic Live, where we'll be broadcasting from the northernmost broadcast studio in the world, one that we make every year. And that is from the 1st to the 8th of May, running from Encounter Live as well. So. Until we are back in about 15, 16 minutes with our submarine engineer live investigation, it's goodbye from Sonodyne HQ and goodbye from Submarine Live for a while. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.